I'll uh, introduce myself. My name is uh, Ed Galindo. I'm a Yaqui Indian and spent 20 good years uh, in the Shoshone Bannock Nation as their science chair. So taught at the, at the tribal school, uh, the science, and then answer an array of tribal questions from how much fertilizer is good to uh, what to do with tribal interest in mining, do all sorts of things. So anyway, it's, I am pleased that you're here. And it's an honor for me to, and I'm gonna chair this part. The chair of this uh, committee is Dr. Rosenberg right here. He's, he's our chair, but I'm gonna chair this part. There's a reason for that. Because in, in uh, speaking to some of the students and, and hearing what was going on, I wanted a chance for our candidate, and I'm gonna uh, introduce her soon, to come before the people, as you would at, on a reservation setting or a nation setting, and explain who you are, what you're doing, what you're thinking. I wanted that setting as a native director. I thought that would be most appropriate. Danielle did an excellent job on her academic uh, lecture as well, but I wanted this one for us. I wanted that, and for, for everybody else. So that's the, that's the thesis of, of meeting in this beautiful place tonight. So I'm gonna be the chair of this, and there's a few things we need to talk about as far as, as what we're gonna do. And so there's a message I have been requested to read from the Equal Opportunity Office that lays some ground rules for all candidates, and this is how we'll proceed. So here it goes. The university extends a sincere welcome to the candidate. We hope that you find our community hospitable. Not hostile, you know, hostile, hostile. <laughs> just joking, just kidding around. Okay, the open forum is an opportunity for you to address the topics the search committee has asked you to address. It's also an opportunity for interested members of the community to ask you questions about your candidacy for this position. Audience, audience members will have the opportunity to provide feedback to the search committee by the way of a form containing questions about their assessment of your qualifications for the position. So it's this blue form here. Uh, Danielle's name's on it. You take it, there's, there's plenty of questions and there's plenty of open space to write your questions if these don't do it. And then just put them back in this envelope if you don't mind. Okay, there's some more. Thank you also to the folks who have taken the time to attend the open forum. It's an important position for the University of Montana. Your involvement is important. Please remember that all searches, including this search, are governed by university equal opportunity policies. Discrimination based on race, color, religion, natural origin, creed, service in the military, polit political ideas, sexual orientation, sex, age, marital or family status or disability is prohibited. As such, it is generally not acceptable to ask questions which would require candidates to disclose personal information about these protected categories. If the chair of the search committee and, and facil uh, facilitator of this forum, which would be me, find a question inappropriate, I will ask the candidate not to respond and give the audience member an opportunity to rephrase the question. This is not meant to embarrass anybody, but simply to ensure that we follow required policies and law as proceeded with the search. So that's our general rules, but I don't mean to uh, put anybody's passion down. This is a, this is a passionate Search with a passionate idea, be passionate about what you do. But we have to follow all the rules for all of our three candidates. That's what we're gonna do. All right, so that will set the stage for uh, the prayer set for the other candidates as well. I just did a general one. Are there any questions so far before I begin? All right. So don't forget these blue forms, they're here. And I did this job. It's time to learn about Danielle. You know, I'm such a bad student of Danielle's name. So I'm gonna call her Danielle Ignace. Ignace. Danielle Ignace. You know, I, I, uh, I tell you a little story. Cause you know, we got lots of time here. Don't worry about that. Just kidding, you guys. <laughs> Looking at your watches, what? Now, um, I approached the, when I was asked to participate at the University of Idaho, I, I thought about it for a while and I thought about not doing it because it's four hours away and I have 10 native students myself. One of them is at uh, Salish Kootenai Tribal College 
He's a master's student. He's studying global climate change and how it affects the native plants and how, how those are being uh, collected differently and looked at differently. So I'm plenty busy, but I thought about it for a second and said, no, count me in. It's important. It's important work that the University of Montana is doing here. It's important work for the native communities. This is a native director. That's a prized position. As a PhD myself, I got it from NASA, I joined the elite group of 0.2% of American Indians with a PhD in a hard science. That's disgusting. That shouldn't be. Danielle joined me, it may be 0.27 now, but it's still not even, not even 1%. And so Danielle and these candidates are helping me. We need to turn that around. That's what this Native Center is about. Yeah, thank you. And it's about, and it's about passion, but it's not, and I, I apologize, it's not really for people in here, it's for the ones that come behind. That's what this is for. These generations of young people, the, de the decisions we make as this committee will affect them. That's why I'm proud to be part of this. And I feel the students' passion. And, and I want us to go forward. And so, as we come through, uh, this, is, this is how we'll conduct ourselves. Those in Indian country have seen this many times. When I approached the committee before, it was a kind of a new idea for some of them. And so we'll see how it goes. But I think it's a good way to get to know people and speak your heart. Again, you can ask your questions in passion. There's some, some you can't, and I'll be, I'll be reminding those of you that, that forget about that if you need your passion. But you can write all sorts of questions you want. Nobody prevents you from that. And send those to, to Ed here, our, our chair, or your president, or provost, wherever you want to. All right. So in the fashion, I've, I've, I've talked about Danielle, but as you all know, well, in the Native community, the people that really talk about you most are your family, like your grandmother and grandfather. I'm probably getting close to grandfather, not grandmother, for her. But anyhow, um, I want her to, to tell her story. Tell us where she's from, and her name, and her doings, and her story. And then we'll have questions. OK? Thank you. Danielle. Well, thank you so much, Ed. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it's a real honor to be here for a lot of reasons, and the fact that this laboratory exists in the first place is really special. And so I'm glad to hear so much talk about passion, and it's true, and I'm here because of that passion. And I have really want to explain to you who I am and where I'm coming from, and that really my life has been about this passion about really increasing the presence and voice of Native Americans in science. and. Also, science in, it, in its own right, in that, um, that these, are, these are two things that are, are really important to me, and I hope I convey that um, to everyone here and, and in the community. Um, so I thought, as Ed mentioned, that I, I would just tell you about myself and, and where I'm coming from and, and you know, how, how I've uh, gotten to this point in my, my path in this uh, science career and, and, and finish with uh, the second half about just some ideas and, and my vision for, that I see for the, for the Native American Research Lab. So just to tell you um, where I'm from, and born and raised in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And here's my, here's my entire family here, my father, uh, Dr. Gerald Ignace, my mother, Georgiana Ignace, uh, my brother, Dr. Lyle Ignace, and my sister, Tecla Ignace. And, um, and I, I'm the baby of, of all three. And it's a really close family, and family is really important to me. Uh, not only just for support, but just in, in um, as we go through and have these shared goals about increasing Native American presence in this country and in leadership roles. So um, really, I kind of grew up in Wisconsin um, knowing that education was essential for success and that my parents really instilled that in me, that, well, one, the need to go to school, uh, of course, that, that was important just to move along in the career path, but life experience was also really important, and that it really was important to be involved in the community and build relationships 
and embrace many cultures, not just our own culture, but other tribes and other cultures in the country. And so really I take that with me and um, as a holistic approach in, 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 my, in my own education and research. And so really, my, my father, um, you know, he's, a, he's an Indian physician, but, and I think he was hoping all of us kids would follow in that path, but being the, the youngest of all three, I was kind of, a, uh, I guess like Ed being a rogue, a, sign, a committee member here, I'm kind of rogue in the family, and, and I decided I, I didn't, um, you know, I, medicine wasn't for me, um, but uh, I, I chose uh, to be a doctor in a completely different realm, and so, um, but I was always excited about science since grade school, and actually I did I did enjoy anatomy and and you know the, those kinds of uh, you know lessons in in grade school. But um, really, overall, I was just really excited about science. And I'm an enrolled member of the Coeur d'Alene Tribe, which is in northern Idaho, and it's really one of my favorite places in the whole world. It's beautiful. Um, you know, I enjoy. Uh, uh, traveling to the area and just in taking in the scenery. And here's my family on, on Lake Coeur d'Alene and hopefully you can make it out. The, the broader um, outline here is, is, the, is the old territory and really it's been whittled down to a small area that's um, uh, outlined here with a plumber uh, smack dab in the middle and up until recently my grandfather was, was still in the area and um, uh, my father is an only child, so um, right currently there's not a, a whole lot of Ignaces running around Plummer, but um, and nonetheless we still visit Plummer, and it's I just uh, it's one of my favorite places to be. So a little bit more about myself, just what I what I enjoy doing and how I I guess keep a balanced life in this busy career path. One is running. I'm a you know I'm a big fan of having a healthy lifestyle and and uh, you know, running marathons and, and here is, uh, it's called the Workout Group and uh, it's based in Tucson and, and really it's my running community, my healthy community and we get together and <clears throat> just have a social network of, of being fit and being healthy and, and that's also a, a way for me to keep balance um, as uh, I maintain my busy research program. And really I just love the outdoors. I, I'm a fan of hiking and camping and you know any setting you can imagine and of course I'm a little bit biased towards plants um, and I've you know growing up I was that kid running around in the woods and uh, usually playing in the dirt so um, you know really I kind of always had an affinity for being outside and being in the outdoors and um, you know of course having this idea about science and wanting to pursue a career in science and enjoying the outdoors it only made sense and it was quite natural that um, I went to the University of Wisconsin at Madison and worked on cows. <laughs> <laughs> so my first um, experience with science or, or research was actually in the School of Veterinary Medicine. I was an undergrad research assistant in the nutritional studies floor of the dairy department. and. Um, you know, most, most students, their first research experience is maybe washing dishes. Um, but mine was, uh, I'd go to the university barn and I'd grind cow fecal samples. And um, in the lab, I'd mix up liver samples. Um, it wasn't exactly uh, glorious or, or, uh, or um, I don't know, I, I left uh, smelling like some of the samples that I was processing. So it wasn't uh, glamorous at all. But I knew that I needed a research experience that gave me something other than just washing the dishes. And that, and I knew that this, I kind of knew right away this wasn't going to be my ultimate passion. And no judgment, if this is someone else's passion, that's, that's great. But uh, I knew that I wasn't going to work on cows forever. Um, so that led me to continuing on in my undergrad studies. I took a general ecology course. And it was this man right here, Dr. Stanley Dotson, who really got me um, kind of my first big break in getting that experience. And really, he was just lecturing in class and said, if you wanted to get research experience, come see me. And so I went to his office and 
and uh, and said, I, yes, I, I'd love to do it, and and um, really started uh, working here with one of his PhD students, and and we quickly became very good friends, and she was one of my first mentors as uh, as an undergrad, and um, so really I. I started by volunteering, and at the time, you know, it was kind of about proving yourself and, and showing that I was responsible and committed to it. And so, I started by volunteering and really got the hang of it, and ended up having a, a senior thesis, um, which may seem far-fetched now, but you know, looking at uh, the identification of the time, critical timing of sex determination in Daphne and Magna. Um, that's a zooplankton you might see if you go to a freshwater, you go in the lake and you pull up a sample, you'll see these, these, uh, these zooplankton uh, floating through the, the sample and that's, that's what I worked on and I still have, um, you know, this affinity for, for these little guys. And um, so that was, that was an incredible experience and, um, <coughs> you know, I was able to carry out an independent research project and, and I really felt like he kind of you know, was open-minded enough to take a chance in, on me, and so I, I, I really appreciate that about him. And, uh, and so I, I graduated in zoology and environmental studies in uh, 2000. Um, while well, at the same time I was doing the, the senior thesis work, I was also part of a pilot group of undergraduates, and we formed the Undergraduate Research Scholars Program. And because there weren't a lot of programs like this at the time, um, we really took it upon ourselves to really have this, this overall goal of increasing um, research opportunities for, for students that from underrepresented uh, minority groups. And so really, it was juniors and seniors that we had research experience, we got together, and to ensure that freshmen and sophomores um, also had that research experience. And so it really brought us together and ultimately it led to really um, opening the doors for discussion and, and sharing uh, ideas about experiences in different cultures. And so this was a great way to also develop leadership just through this kind of peer mentoring. Um, but before I moved on from Wisconsin, um, I would say one of the, the biggest life-changing things for me was was getting um, uh, chosen to, to be part of the research experience for undergraduates program. And this is a program funded through NSF. And um, in the summer of 2000, I was selected to participate in this program. And uh, here in Crested Butte, Colorado, it's the site of the Rocky Mountain Biological Lab. And um, the elevation of about 9,500 feet. And it's a, it's a tight-knit community. They, they cap it at 150. And it's really, it brings together our faculty and students and, and you know, staff and, and researchers from all over, um, all over the world. So really, it was a tight-knit group and, and um, really um, helped solidify for me what I, what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. And here, I, in particular, with my advisor, Neil Martinez, <clears throat> I worked on food webs you know, who eats who, whether it was the insects eating plants and or other, other insects eating other insects. And so I looked at that and how that was different across different elevations across the area. And um, I don't work on food webs now, but it's through this program I really found my passion in science. And uh, one, I knew that I needed to be by mountains. You know, I discovered I was a mountain girl. And the other was that I needed to work on plants. And so, for me, this was uh, this changed my life and, and really set the stage for for what I wanted to do in my career. So, again, I return to this this passion of of the great outdoors and and really appreciating my surroundings and thinking about the environment and you know just even being outside thinking about how the environment shapes you know my surroundings and and the plants that are there and. Really, there are a couple questions that come up, and one is, why are there differences in biodiversity across all these landscapes? And how does the environment play a role in shaping those? And so that's, these are the bigger questions that I was really uh, keyed in on from this research experience as an undergrad. And uh, I knew I wanted to pr pursue something uh, addressing these questions. So my research program is really based on understanding how 
ecosystems change from ones that are high in diversity to ones that are low in diversity. And so this really gets at how species that are, are not native to this type of community um, come in and invade and then start to dominate um, this previously rich uh, uh, high diversity community. And so really my work addresses some of the mechanisms and the impacts of these non-native species invasions. And in turn, how the environment and other organisms play a role in the way these plant communities change. And again, this is a, as a, a broad question, you know, it's a fundamental question and trying to understand how, um, how biodiversity is different across systems. Um, and because of that, my approach is interdisciplinary and highly collaborative and, and certainly requires uh, a lot of expertise to really fully understand this kind of question. And so really for me, um, I've had to draw on from many different disciplines and form a lot of collaborations to get the work done. And I, um, to address these questions, I, my graduate work was at the University of Arizona in, and uh, working in southeastern Arizona, and it's just a beautiful area to do research, and it's um, been highly productive and, and fruitful uh, place to be. And also did my postdoctoral research uh, after graduating, getting my PhD in 2006. Um, and so really for the past five years, looking at, at this big question of looking at the, understanding the community response, and this is in the Chihuahuan Desert, which was near Portal, Arizona. Um, hopefully you can, you can see some of this might be cut off, but um, at the same time, my teaching philosophy um, is based on providing a fundamental background and in a way to develop critical thinking skills to carry out independent research. And I really draw upon different forms and, and ways of teaching and, and incorporates a lot of things such as lectures and discussions and um, individual meetings one-on-one. -on -one but really about getting hands-on experience here, getting out in the field, laboratory exercises, field exercises. And I really feel like getting this hands-on experience and drawing upon a lot of different avenues is a great way to really get a fundamental uh, background in, in some in research topics. And, and along, with the, along this lines, mentoring is a really important aspect um, for me, and this is, incorporates both undergraduates and, and graduate students. And really, for me, it's about creating this supportive community and as a way to develop some of these skills that are necessary. So I, I, I would guess that a lot of you are familiar with the, uh, um, the Sloan Foundation uh, our graduate uh, partnership. I was part of the first um, group at the University of Arizona where this partnership was formed and it was really designed to address this national need for Native Americans really to prepare them to be leaders in, in, in spurring economic growth and, and really just going out whether it's at the, at the colleges or in government but really getting out in the community and being leaders and so the program was essential for me as, as really getting this support group and I, you know, it felt like a special opportunity to me. It was, it was incredibly um, thrilling to be part of this group, getting to know each other in all these different areas of research. And we all had the same common goal. And um, through this, we also mentored undergraduates and really tried to inspire the young students to uh, see that, yes, this is very possible. We're in grad school, we're finishing, we have these goals in, in an academic career path. Uh, and, and you could do it too, and, and this, is how, this is how you go about doing that. So uh, to me, it was it, it's just an incredible uh, program, and I know, I know that Montana has also um, started the same program here, and, and uh, I think it's a great success. <coughs> but um, you know, aside from research and teaching and mentoring, I really have a passion about getting out in the community, really being part of the community, and not just the university, um, but also the, the broader community as a whole. And so I've been, on, um, been involved with a nonprofit organization in Tucson, Arizona called Native Seed Search. And SEARCH stands for Southwestern Endangered Arid Research Resource Clearinghouse. It's a mouthful, hence the search. Um, but really, it's, we have this, this common goal. The, the vision is to really 
protect and conserve and then distribute you know, heirloom seeds, agricultural seeds that are adapted to the, that area of the Southwest and you really preserve the cultures that are associated with, the, with these seeds. And so it's making sure that they're protected and yet also available um, when necessary. And so again, this is really about bringing the whole community together for this common mission and you know, people really get excited about um, just preserving these seeds that, that are special to the Southwest and then also kind of maintaining a, a gardener's movement, something that's sustainable and, and healthy. So I joined the board of directors in Native Seed Search in 2008 and I've been voted to a secretary. I'm currently vice chair and I've chaired the marketing committee and I've also chaired the uh, Native American committee. And this has been especially rewarding for me because that really allowed me to get out into the Native American community in particular. And this was because I wanted to ensure, and as well as the organization, to ensure that, that um, these, these communities were protected and that they were getting the, a, a rightful interaction with the organization and that that um, so we developed a code of ethics in, in the process of in developing intellectual property rights and or in other words a cultural property rights because as I mentioned there are traditions associated with these seeds it's not just about the food but there are cultural traditions and we really want to not take anything away from that but but conserve that and um, so um, essentially have gone out and gotten feedback from the local tribes and really tried to build and maintain these relationships that help get the organization started. And so that involved um, starting an advisory panel with Native Americans. And so, you know, I feel like this work is very much not done, but, you know, of course I have to move on. Um, but uh, this organization will always kind of have a special place in my heart and I, and I suspect I will always uh, contribute in some way as I move forward. And just to point out some other wonderful things about it, there's a Native American free seed program. And so essentially any, any tribe can contact the organization and, and get, the, get the seeds for free. And, and it really goes back to these original relationships that were formed. Um, and so that, you know, we, it was a, a two-way street. You know, uh, we helped protect the seeds, but also provided more seeds. We grew them out and provided them back to the, the Native American community. So for me, it's been really thrilling, and it really brings brings the community together to just learn about the seeds and and how important they are. But um, so that that tells you a, a little bit about um, how how I've gotten to this point here and. But really, it's about um, why I'm here today, which is the Native American Research Laboratory. And um, really, I see it as not just a laboratory, not just a way to provide research opportunities for students, but really to empower them to become leaders. And, um, and so there's a few highlight points that I want to make today, which is increasing recruitment, increasing retention, Expanding the idea of community and family because there is a sense of community and but also as you try to become a leader at times you may be separated from your family and so uh, and it's an incredible incredibly important um, part of life for me and as I suspect other the, the other students that are trying to start research and and so really um, I like to, to think of it as yes starting a new community but this this ends up being your family as well. So really it's about creating more opportunities, having a holistic science experience, and it's not just about um, getting different research ideas or research opportunities, but there's a culture and a, you know, traditions that should be maintained as well and, and considered as, as you go forward. And um, so really the idea is to discover new leaders in science and, and find a way to empower students to be those leaders. So first, um, for me, at, at the foundation of this is interacting with the Native American community as a whole. And this is really um, important as a way to hear the voice of the, of the members of the community. And so I would see that a need is, is to create a forum for members of the community to voice their needs and to voice their concerns and issues. And this is 
This is true for everyone involved in the state, tribes in the state, undergraduates, graduate students, and even postdoc researchers. And so I guess in a, in a sense there could be something uh, of a kind of an informal or an advisory panel, and this is simply a way to um, self-evaluate. I, I, I hate to assume um, anything that you know, my, that what I'm doing is, the, is, is entirely the, the correct path. And so really I want to understand what the needs are and, and what, what the, uh, and hear, hear the voice of everyone. And so really, you know, it's about self-evaluating and trying to understand, am I on the right track? Is this, is this institution on the right track? And, and so this is really, to me, the foundation of this. And Again, with that, that kind of um, philosophy in mind, really wanted to develop inter-campus relationships in, in Montana. And this really is strongly based on including Montana's tribal colleges and, and even um, you know, the Montana's colleges and universities, including the Montana State University system. And I feel there's no reason to be competitive. And you know, there might be um, you know, programs associated with, with some of these other institutions, but you know, I see that as a positive thing. That it really is about increasing the presence and, and opportunities for Native Americans. So I see no reason why not to interact and, and have this uh, common goal. So um, one thing about the Native American Research Lab is really about increasing the presence. Um, really not just locally or regionally, but across the nation. And one way is kind of just to develop its exposure in, in a way advertising or marketing. Um, and really, I think about it as keeping in, people engaged through the internet. I mean, really, uh, any, any t you know, the internet is really the source and the key these days. And so the website needs to be kind of all encompassing and provide as much information as possible. And of course, you know, like us on Facebook is one of the most common catchphrases out there. And everyone, anyone and everyone seems to have a Facebook account. And, and really, this is just a way to keep everyone engaged and keep everyone in the loop about the happenings and, and calendar of events and who's out there and what's happening. And so um, I really see that as, as a way to increase the, the presence and the face of the, of the lab. Um, and so this also uh, creates a forum for, to increase interactions so that people can voice their concerns, this keeps people engaged and keeps people connected, and really I like to see increased participation uh, of everyone. Um, and so this could be used as a tool to increase re recruitment locally and regionally, and, and this really gets down to um, including grade school, K through 12. As I mentioned, you know, how I got to this point, I really was excited about science from, from the beginning, and, and I had wonderful role models through my parents and my family, but maybe not everyone has that. And so, um, you know, the laboratory can really be a way to provide some of that inspiration and, and excitement. And um, so really, it's, it's a way to increase recruitment nationally and, and, and really get everyone excited about science. And, um, but really there needs to be a, a local movement uh, first and something that establishes uh, 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 consistency and one would be to integrate the campus and, and <laughs> this is no, by no means binding and I don't mean to exclude anyone but just, just as, a, as the first, first cut and, and of a first list it really involves so many people and so many academic units and you know, it's, it's so exciting to see that this laboratory exists and that so many people here are, are very interested in it. And so I really want to include all the academics, as many as I can, to be involved and be, be uh, research mentors in the program. And again, we're talking about local movement and integrating everyone on campus. And again, I, this does not mean to exclude anyone, but these are just some of the, the first programs that come to mind. It really you know, being able to integrate these programs, not, not to um, uh, take them apart or change them, but really involve them as well and just foster these relationships and lines of communication between all of them. And so that it would be great to have a laboratory or a forum that includes all of these programs on campus so that there's, you know, students are just two clicks away from understanding what's happening with all of them, what's, 
what are the concerns and, and how can they participate? And, and that's, a, again, a two-way street of, of participating in the lab and then the lab participating in other programs. And so really, I see creating a new community and this keeps the campus engaged. Um, as I mentioned, participate and support activities and goals. Um, and this can really help enhance statewide and regional collaborations and partnerships. And really, at the national and international collaborations, I, I don't see as a far-fetched idea. I think if, you know, wanting to create a, ultimately a cross-cultural and interdisciplinary experience, you know, that's, that's I see as that as a trajectory and may not happen immediately, but it's certainly building on the local and regional aspect. Um, it wouldn't be out of line to develop this on a national, international level. So, but really to, to, to address some of these issues, there needs to be funding, right? And so uh, I would see expanding the funding and this is just a, a list of being creative and, and because so many different areas of, of science will be, would be included, um, you know, that means it's expanding the idea of the sources of funding and, and that would include all these, you know, organizations and, and, and foundations that really have a stake in, in this kind of uh, program. And so if you expand the funding, you can expand the research opportunities that are available and it's really um, uh, increasing opportunities in the STEM disciplines, which is science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And, and it would be wonderful to see a lab that's booming with all kinds of opportunities that are, are local and across the state that involve all different kinds of organisms and ecosystems and, and uh, methods of data analysis and, and, uh, and uh, technologies. And to basically create opportunities for students so that they can find their passion in science. And it could be cow. It, it could be grinding, uh, you know, liver samples in, in Wisconsin. If if that's their passion, that's wonderful. I want to support that. It didn't work for me, but you know, it may work for someone else. And and to be honest, it's it may not be on the first try. And as you, if I, I hopefully convey to you that it took a couple of research experiences to find what I was truly passionate about, and it was. Uh, not only being in a beautiful uh, surrounding, but really working on plants and some of these big questions. And I really wouldn't have discovered that if I hadn't kept at it and kept trying and, and really found people that were willing to take a chance on me and, 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 and really help me develop um, those, those ideas. And so really it's just about generating excitement and helping students find their passion, whether it's they're in, they're in grade school um, or college or, or grad school. And it would be wonderful to see a research experience program, perhaps something similar to what I have experienced through uh, REU, which is funded by NSF, but something that's special, special to NARA. And this, again, could include K through 12, undergraduates, masters and PhD programs. Something that, again, allow people to find their passion and maybe do rotation, something that allows them to just experience as much as they could so that they could find, figure out what they, what they love to do in science. Um, so again, there could be an REU program or, or seeking other kinds of funding that allows for independent research projects to be carried out. And increasing outreach in education is essential. And um, this would really provide a unique approach um, that is linked with research activities. And really, this, the, center could, uh, the laboratory could serve as a center for some of these outreach and education and, and kind of, in a way, citizen science um, uh, 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 forums. And so, I, you know, I heard that there's a science fair that's going to be here in a couple of weeks, and that's the exact kind of activity that would help with this kind of outreach and education and so that you know, kids of all ages could see science in action and interact with the university and, and have like hands-on experience with science and research. Maybe that would, it would get them excited about what opportunities are out there and, and what, might, you know, what might they find um, interesting to them. And so 
it would really provide a great setting for experimenting with all kinds of approaches um, to really just learning about science and, and the process and, and the opportunities that are available. And essentially, but having, having fun and, and being creative about it. And, and there's so many, so many ways to get students of all ages excited about science and, and finding their passion. It really could be, include, whoa, apparently really include a network of volunteers twice. Um, <laughs> really a, a lot of volunteers. But, um, uh, but really it's about being creative about the partnerships, whether it's partnerships on campus. And, and, and that could be in the way of saving effort. You know, if, if another program on campus is seeking funding for a certain activity or program, well, why not partner up and, and, say, and save that effort and really do something together? And um, so it, it's by no means to exclude anyone, but it's really about having this, this common goal. And, and there really could be a lot of creative ways to get the community involved. And bringing bringing NARL to the teachers, bring teachers to NARL, whether it's one day experience, a field trip, and as I mentioned, volunteers to maybe help facilitate that if funding can't be available right away. And so, you know, there's a lot of fun things and fun activities you can do to really increase the excitement and um, get the students uh, on the path to a career in science. And, and um, so it's really about getting all these ideas and, and that could come from students as well. Um, but really, even though there's, there might be an, an increase in interest in science and, and uh, excitement for it, well, there needs to be retention as well. And, and as I mentioned, I've been involved in a lot of mentoring programs myself and, and I see them as important for me, as uh, you know, there are certain times. You know, sometimes life just happens. You know, there's personal things that happen that may get in the way of, of you know, a, a, that disciplined academic path. But um, when when these programs are in place to help support and create this support system, it really is a, a very useful um, a, a way to create that new family uh, as as you're away from your own. And, and so really having role models, role models of whether, and role models can come in the form of older undergrads, graduate students, uh, faculty, or, or uh, you know, postdocs like myself that hopefully will be professor very soon. And, and so, um, you know, role models come in many different ages and stages. And, and really, um, that really helps net create a network of all these different students at different stages to to create the support system and you know really build these relationships and so um, really the, the support and the retention for the retention will come in a variety of different ways and and so that comes from the family and friendships or coursework if there's you know some sort of class you know it, you know a science curriculum is is broad and difficult and I wasn't necessarily the best at physics, and it wasn't my favorite. Um, but uh, you know, and I needed I needed help for that. And that there really needs to be a way to make sure that the right connections on campus are made. To well, if they need help or tutoring or mentoring, that those that those relationships are formed. Um, and really, for me, group meetings, and whether informal or just socializing. You know, I know there's a soup soup Friday here, and and um, you know, creating that kind of casual or formal you know, form for interacting is, is a great way to find that support system and, um, and essentially create role models and by becoming, um, by having students that can be role models for younger students, um, essentially you know, it creates a sense of purpose and, and really helps, helps generate that leadership. And but it's a, you know a career in science isn't easy. I don't think anyone anyone would uh, would say that it was. And and it's it's not about just pit, you know it, yes find your passion and what interests you most. But it's not about just deciding that and having it come easy. And and it is a, a learning process. And I feel like I still learn. And and you know I feel like a basic career on on thinking and learning. And it, it, it wouldn't ever stop. And and really. There's a skill set that's that's required, and 
And so this includes you know, writing skills, presentation skills, and, and getting fellowships and grants. And, and hopefully the, I see the laboratory as developing and harnessing some of these skills. And as, like I, as I mentioned, it's important to get um, the, the find, find the, the career path in science, but really there's a skill set necessary to do that. And, and the laboratory can be as an all-encompassing way to make sure that, that the right partnerships and the right uh, people get in contact to ensure that, that, uh, that, that these skills are developed. And, and one way that can happen is through partnerships on a more national scale. One of them is through SACNIS, Society for the Advancement of Chicanos and Native Americans in Science. And I know there's, oops, at times been um, a chapter in the American Indian Science and Engineering Society on campus. And, but really, these, there can be local chapters formed, and, and there's regional conferences and national conferences. And, and organizations such as SACNIS is a really, is a really great avenue for a pro providing some additional leadership, leadership skills and, and opportunities as such they have a week-long institute in DC. And again, there can be interactions between local chapters and in a way have regional meetings and, and you know, even a national conference. And this could be science in general or it could be specialized um, uh, topics, whether it's about water rights uh, on, 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 on reservations, and, and really that encompasses a lot of different disciplines, whether it's, it's a, you know, social, social sciences and, and, you know, environmental sciences. And it's cut off at the bottom, but really it would be great to have an en enhanced national network um, among all of these um, different programs. <coughs> And really, so in the end, it's discovering new leaders, helping Native American students, yes, find their passion and find their path in science, and have a way to harness the creativity and yet also develop the skill set necessary and the, the discipline um, necessary for success in science. And this is a wonderful institute that's here, and it can be a way to merge past many different Native Americans toward a common goal, which is really increasing the presence across the country. <clears throat> and this is a great opportunity to create the institute for this holistic experience, which includes culture, traditions, uh, and many different sciences and ways of thinking about solving uh, big problems. Um, and so in the end, it's creating Native American leaders in science. And this is necessary in all levels. It doesn't necessarily mean um, you know, being a professor at the university, otherwise, other, I mean, for myself, that's, that was, that's my ultimate goal. But, you know, really we need everyone at every level, whether in, in any field. And as, as Ed had mentioned early, the percentage of Native Americans in science, especially getting PhDs, is so incredibly low. And, um, and it's, it's just not enough, and it needs to keep on growing. And that it means having these, an institution like the Native American Research Lab to provide these opportunities and really, really um, create this network of support to, to do that. So I thank you for your attention, and, and uh, I'd be happy to discuss any of these ideas um, about the future of the lab. Thanks. Do we have questions? Yes. I don't have a question, but I have a comment. Sure. I'd just like to commend you for your efforts that you've done. Um, I know as a classroom teacher that the uh, hands-on projects work a lot better for our Native kids especially. Uh, they get so much more out of it. But what I like is the SEEDS or the SEARCH program, because at the Blackfeet Community College, they do have a, a greenhouse, you know, with all of our uh, plants for medicinal and ceremonial purposes and we're losing those plants you know like echinacea for instance or you know, sage, uh, sweet pine, the things that we need and they're on public land like park land only because they've been depleted in other areas so to 
the research to get those back into the natural habitat where they grow, I think this would be a fantastic opportunity. And I applaud you for that, because I think that's something that we're going to need in the future. So thank you. And I saw your passion, and I was just so excited by that passion. And although it's in plants, and, and I can relate to you on that area as far as passion in medicine, but my passion is more concerning health disparities in any country, country with the time that you're your dad and your brother, and, and it's just an honor to have you here. And that's where I'm leading. As Native people, sometimes we talk in a circle, but, but I just wanted to also thank you for providing a role model for us, um, just just your articulate ability and to be able to express yourself and the discipline that it took for you to be away from your family and to secure the PhD um, is just really commendable and and to be you know as, as Indian physicians three tenths of one percent it's it's disgusting but as Indian PhD and Indian PhD oh, you know it's just very commendable and I just want to thank you for being a role model for us and for for your perseverance in um, a climate that might not have been as supportive as the one that you're hoping to develop. So, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I actually came with a question that I was going to ask all the candidates, and then you answered it before I could ask it. <laughs> and it, was, it had two parts, and they're kind of ironic because, on the one hand, one of the problems. Them, uh, native people going getting enough getting enough in the sample is the whole pipeline. And so I really appreciated your talking K-12, having some real ideas how to reach out to K-12. And so and we had Indian Ed for All in the state of Montana. And sometimes with Indian Ed for All, people can understand that maybe they'll throw in a piece of history, but they don't know how to make it science. And so there's something really wonderful in what you said, and I think you kind of answered that. But the second part of that is that here you are coming into a position, and my assumption is you'll want to continue your own research agenda, and I'm asking you about everything from case, you know, we're going, we're talking about international and national networking and so on. How do you see yourself protecting your own research agenda? still making this the life center that it needs to be? Yeah, it's an excellent question because it, <laughs> as I started, you know, I have I have these passions. One is, is the mentoring and in, increasing in voice and presence of Native Americans, but also I love science. I am passionate about it. I'm, I'm doing exactly what I want to do and I love doing it. And so I can't, I can't give up either one, and uh, in, a, in a sense, they need to be integrated in some way. Um, but you know, through sometimes it'll it'll have to be backing off. I, you know, maybe not as much hands-on as I have been because in my own research program in Arizona, it's I've had really had to direct and 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 lead the field work myself, and and really hopefully I can develop a research program that. Um, I have a group of managers that, that was uh, helped me, and if, if you saw my research talk, uh, lab technicians or, or, or even grad students are a wonderful way to do that, and um, so that I can feel comfortable knowing that the lab's taken care of and research is happening without me always having to be there. Um, but also having something local, um, you know, I, I would maintain that research program, but um, you know, to me it's about place as well, and, and um, Really getting excited about where you live and understanding you know your surroundings. So it it would be a, a local system, uh, something that's not too far away. So that you know I, I could go from a meeting and perhaps be in the field in the same day. And um, but yeah, it, it would be it, it would be certainly a difficult balance. Um, <laughs> but that's something I need to do uh, in both cases. I guess uh, in terms of science is, you know, fear is that 
on reservation of the, the issue of fracking for oil, <coughs> the impact upon uh, the use of water to process fracking and, and, and places to put the water, I think it's the science and the chemicals used within this water, the unknown that the people don't understand. Uh, I guess the question is, uh, how would you, uh, in a sense, through the university system, uh, help to bring understanding to people in these local areas that are impacted by these types of developments? And, in a sense, they're an economical development for the tribe, but yet the impacts are unknown. And so how through the university uh, system and the outreach and whatnot can you help, I guess, um, bring understanding to people who, in a sense, are not even to be the uh, current uh, practices? Yeah, it's a, I mean, it's a very relevant issue for for many tribes you know something that that has economic issues but also environmental impacts and and really those are really important issues that yes it need to be understood at, um, on an entirely different level and the university would be a great way to um, you know bring you know try to find an understanding of that and you know there needs to be some way to um, either see the site, you know, it ga gather a group of, um, you know, many different d disciplines on campus that can actually go to the to to the the site and try to understand what all the issues are and and you know try to try to bridge that gap and, and really understand, you know, the different perspectives and, and the needs and um, so it would to create some sort of interactive forum that you know you have a dialogue about it and and um, you know really try to get that overall understanding. Just, just more comments. Uh, I like the idea of uh, elevation of food webs. You know, and because it is in, in seasons, there are certain seasons to gather medicinal plants that was mentioned, and, you know, and most of them are up at high elevations back home. But our political <coughs> limits created by national parks and whatnot where most of these plants are. You know, and that's the problem. How do we over overcome some of these political uh, limitations, you know, in, in a sense for allowing people, I guess, to recultivate those types of plants and to be able to use them again. And, but, you know, we're, we're, we're shut out by these, you know, such things as creations of national parks and you know, different types of areas like this that limit you into these areas. And you also mentioned water. You know, it's really important you know, like nutrients of human, of, of, of all plants, and all life, animals and humans and plant life. But that's one of the biggest concerns too, is the water usage. And, mm -hmm. and I guess to the university systems and, and how to protect this water. And to our environmental programs, we're getting so much that identify the problem, but yet there's no actual way to uh, resolve it. Mm -hmm. I sense that, you know, they, it's identified but how we go about perhaps the system, university systems to develop something to address those means of resolving these problems and to keep them clean and up. I mean, these are just thoughts. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I have a question here and then back here. Go ahead. Well, I just have a comment. As a staff member at the College of Health Professions and Biomedical Sciences, I really got excited to design a seminar, but being here tonight really got me excited for you being here at the University of Montana. Especially when you talk about collaboration, because we need that. And so and I just wanted to say thank you for coming.
exam time, you know, there'd be a room, about four people, and have like three or four tutors. And uh, when I was growing up, my mother taught me good manners, you know, raise your hand, and then uh, you're, you're recognized, and then you get to talk or whatever, you know. And uh, that, that didn't seem to work here. I raised my hand, and then one of the tutors would see me on the way out, and then he'd walk over there, and somebody would scrap him and say, hey, help me, man. You know, I, I, I didn't get the help that I thought that I, I needed because I wasn't ready. You know, and that's kind of how we are. The American people, you know, we're not, uh, you know, touchy feely. You know, we're not, you know, we're not grabbing and stuff like that. We, we kind of struggle with, with that, you know, going into the uh, university system and learning and stuff. And uh, I, I guess the question that I do have for you is, how would you, how would you address that? Because it seems that, uh, you know, like in here, they have a math, uh, not a math, but a writing, writing to you know, he comes in here, he has all this, and uh, I see people in there all the time. I should go in there myself, but I'm not writing. <laughs> you know, I'm taking physics, and I'd rather take a writing class over than take physics over again, you know. And, you know, it would be nice if you had, a, a, like I said, tutors, uh, you know, calculus tutors, uh, physics tutors, you know, for, for like the age students, where are you going to still more comfortable with uh, sitting around with a bunch of uh, other, you know, like, you know, your same color skin and you, you, uh, you know, you're able to, you know, pass it like you think better instead of, you know, okay, I hope you come over here, you know, and, you know, that's just a question that I have is would you be able to adjust that if you were put in a position? Yeah, yeah, you know, it's, it's a, it, that's a really big need, and, and you know, I, I would see that as um, a way to address that is hopefully find someone that isn't helping everyone on campus, but maybe that there's something very special and specific that can be done at the laboratory as opposed to going over to the department of it. Really finding someone that's willing to volunteer, or, you know, that time and, and you know, in a, in a, in a, special, in a special way that, that this relationships formed and so that it's for Native Americans specifically and, and not for everyone and that you know the the laboratory can be the center for for that as well and so you know I'd really try to just establish establish that connection on campus and get them get them involved get them to come over um, specifically for the Native students mm -hmm. question here yeah um my name is Jerry. I'm a student here in geology too. I'm a class of Native. And I have a lot of questions that I think I would be um, asked to rephrase, so I'm going to try to review limit myself. Um, do you, how would you, how do you see incorporating um, geology, or do you see geology being incorporated into Tunaro? And um, kind of along uh, being his uh, lines too, I, been here I think three years and have wanted to do undergraduate research since semester one. And I think a lot of uh, what Dana said is I've uh, kind of like been in chemistry, I've been in you know, I've been physics, I've been in math, all of these departments that um, you know I just want to get my food in the door. I'll do dishes. I don't care. You know, do, to do something. And so how would you um, make that it happen basically because I can't seem to make it happen mm -hmm. and um, and I wonder if some of it is not what I, I'm not going to be a very um, soft and kind of person I have a lot of them pretty out there but I you know I can't seem to get this uh, I get some of my good friend and you know so how how does that happen how would you mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I completely understand understand that issue. It, it, hopefully, it, it was clear in in my own experience. I really had to seek seek that out and really push push the doors open. And and it's it was difficult. You know, there weren't as back then uh, there weren't as many opportunities as maybe there are today at that same university. And um, at the time, there really for me wasn't. Uh, a, a program that was helping me get those opportunities where I could just join a program and then pick from from a list and and so really I, I, I expect that I could reach out to all the academic units and, and it's you know like I, as I mentioned it's not 
you know, the list that was up there is not limiting at all. It's certainly, it's a wide open, wide open door. And it's, you know, it, that's your interest, great. I, I would love to see, see that as an opportunity. And so I, the laboratory I, I would see as, as a way, yes, that you can look at the opportunities available and that, not that you have to push all the doors. You can certainly do that yourself. Um, and, and, but certainly I would see the role of the lab as, already having formed and established some of those opportunities and so that you can come in and and whether it's through specifically I, I hopefully it was through University of Montana but if there's something else in, in the state that can that also maybe there's expertise there that isn't necessarily here and hopefully that's that's an opportunity as well mm -hmm. that's a good any other questions yes back there as an indigenous student in the sciences I've also I've often felt a culture clash between sciences and my indigenous identity. Do you feel the need to influence these students that you're going to be mentoring um, to pursue their indigenous identity while pursuing the sciences? Yeah, I, I certainly, it's to me, it's not about breaking that apart at all. It's about maintaining that. And and there would be, you know, again, it's the open door. It's an open door. And, you know, about having all these different groups involved in, in uh, you know, Native American studies and, and whether it was here and, or again, at, you know, different different institution, um, you know, that's great. And, and I would see it as, you know, like kind of an ultimate cross-cultural experience in that, you know, really respecting other people's traditions and um, you know in maintaining your own I don't I don't see that that needs to be separate from you know the, the pursuit your pursuit in science and you know I feel that um, having that sense of identity is really important and you know my, my family was a great uh, I had great role models in my family for that and it certainly affects my my passions in life and, and, and theirs as well and so there's kind of like these these big goals we have and and so, yeah, I think it's necessary to maintain all of that. Mm -hmm. Any others? Yes, sir. I was, uh, very, I was very interested in a lot of the things that you talked about. I wonder if you could say a little bit more about search. And I was really interested in how um, the university and the tribal communities, how you develop those relationships uh, with each other. <laughs> yeah, and that's, you know, a, a need and a, hopefully it would be a great mediator of that and really reach trying to reach out as many people as I could and um, you know that and that comes to in, in an administrative level and, and it's really just the individual faculty that are there so um, really it would be about going there and, and you know having this kind of two-way interaction of 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 going to those those tribal colleges and and, and having them uh, come here and Having this, you know, this this dialogue and this interaction, and hopefully this the excitement's there for them too, and that that um, you know their their involvement's needed, and hopefully they they would they would be excited about that. Mm -hmm. Any others? That's more than one question. Yeah, go ahead, sir. Thought though, you invasive species in the weeds, the reservations, you know, with all the art particular, um, you know, it limits like in gravel, you, know, you can try to use gravel for, for uh, development of whatever, you know, your uh, your, your regulation again, once you have to, if it's best weed invested or something, but you have a lot of invasive species of, you know, not just in the reservation, but across the state now, and, and it's, well, with that weed being the biggest one on our reservation, and, you know, that's, I guess, studies to control that. To me, I always think it's natural. It's first taken over. Maybe that's a process of first healing itself. Is what puts in weeds. You know, when you destroy land, there, the first thing that comes in as you break up the ground, the sage comes in first. And that's one of the big medicinal healers for Native Americans. I said, well, maybe it's taken care of itself. Yet somebody's trying to kill the weed too. You know, to understand that science of that. You know, is, you know, is that really? You know, it makes you wonder. You know, the wonderment is what drives research, I guess. So you know creating thoughts like that, you know, on own, but your thought of going to these, going through the reservations and finding the problems and finding ways to resolve the system and getting students interested and curious about that type of thing, going down to the grade schools and all of them, science fair, before all they ever want to do is make a volcano in the middle school. <laughs> <laughs> and beyond that. But, you know, 
know that uh, you know there's so much thing about air quality. You know that's a big concern over there. The, the mercury that's being as, as people studying the air quality and some filters and whatnot, their systems of study. You know they're they're identifying these problems for environmental, local environmental programs. And I guess through science, I guess going to those environmental deals and, like the asbestos concerns, uh, you know, the asbestos, the mold over there, and our, our housing projects, the invasion, the hamster virus concern of you know the mice and stuff. You know, there's people who died. Some from our reservation, but not, not you know, maybe one or two in the night, but you know, what was perhaps from some other place or not, but understanding this. And, but the mold is one of the biggest issues over there right now in the housing and, and the respiratory uh, diseases. There are a lot of people with asthma now. You know, and the, diabet the diabetes, <clears throat> that is a big concern. Because, you know, is it because of the, uh, you know, the science of that, the biological? changes in, in the food we eat and that we don't eat that we did previously and you know that type of thing and so people are always wondering you know, how do I why are so many diabetics now over there uh, so how much all these people on dialysis now you know, but where does it all come from and why you know, these thoughts you know? but as you said you have to go over there find the problems and I guess through the system of study and research you know, you know, but those are just some of the things that Problems over there just that are stand out to me. So. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, sir. I have a question. Uh, my name is Vernon. I'm a grad student here. And just from, from listening to uh, the councilman, you know, obviously there's there's immense need on the reservation. Uh, one. <clears throat> and, and with that, there's an immense need to link the reservations here in Montana to the University of Montana. In a, in a really um, uh, consistent kind of way, if you will. Um, with that, <clears throat> you know, it's it's. I think about just the pool of students that's available, the pool of native students that are available to you um, as director of a lab such as that, and <clears throat> you know, if you look around the university. I mean, I look around the room, and I think every Native person I see in this room is from Montana. So basically what I'm saying is it makes sense to really have a, a focus on those reservations right here in Montana, because those are the students that are coming to you. So with that being said, um, when we talk about, um, you know, mentoring and, and the process of mentoring, there's an immense need for Native role models, not only here, but everywhere. But right here, it, it, it's, it's kind of, there's an awareness growing. And when you talk about having a research lab, you're talking about research, you're talking about graduate students, you're talking about people thinking and ideas. <clears throat> With that comes the process of the mentoring. When you really get down and look at that, what you're talking about is taking students on and chairing their committee and helping them write pieces and dissertations. Um, because of the lack of role models here, what you're going to find is students are going to flock to you. You may have at one time, and when we're needy, man, we're going to come to you, you know? Um, but, but, you know, graduate students do need help, especially working on master's thesis. And, and so my question is, are you ready for that? <laughs> But, you know, but, but and I guess where I'm going with that is, is are you aware of that for one? Two, are, are you prepared for that? Because, you know, if you're, if you're working with a student, you're going to find yourself, for instance, a, a, a native student may not even be in your research interests or even your field, such as what you're teaching, but they may, they may come to you just because they have a, a link. You know, you may have a, a, a link to to a, a, a certain individual you're working with in a field. And so, almost instantly, because you're native, you're going to be V1. <laughs> so, <laughs> I guess if that makes, in, in, in a simple way, um, how, how, how do you see yourself being that, that mentor, that role model, 
And, and are you prepared for the volume of students that are going to be coming there? Well, I'm glad you point that out. Well, I'm glad that's an issue, and I'm glad these are your questions, because you know, I, I wouldn't be here if I didn't feel like I was prepared to really take on a huge responsibility and really be there for the students and, of all ages. And so, um, like I, as I hopefully drive home the point again, this is really my passion, and it's just such a need. And so, yeah, again, I, I wouldn't be here, and I, you know, I'm thrilled to be here. I think it's exciting, and so. I'm glad that there would be that kind of excitement and hopefully people can see me as, as a resource. And, but I, I hear you that maybe I can't set up, you know, 200 individual meetings in a week. And uh, so there needs to, I mean, I, <laughs> you know, hopefully there's just got to be creative ways that I could, one, you know, do the mentoring myself and, and hopefully a, a I don't know whether it's a workshop or a guest lecture series or, you know, I haven't quite, you know, figured out all those details yet. But, you know, that's that's exciting to me. You know, and uh, right now as my my advisor is away on sabbatical, I'm running the lab, and and it's you know it's fun to me to help these the grad students while he's away, and you know, I'm mentoring them with their projects, and they're all at different stages of writing their dissertation or. You know, they just have a statistical question, or they're writing their pro their proposals for their dissertation, and what they're going to do. And and for me personally, um, I I feel that I I have developed those, and, and to a point where I feel like I can help the students in that. And so, um, I'm I'm really glad to hear that there would be people really interested in meeting me. So yeah, I, there have to be some creative ways to, I guess, share 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 that mentoring and and. I, I do think one-on-one one -on -one means are very important, um, but also group group settings are are important as well. But you know, in, in my experience with grad school, it wasn't just about the one-on-one -on -one with the advisor. Yes, your advisor is essential, and and all the role models on campus. But I really learned a lot through my fellow students as well, and and I think I think a lot of people would say that. And so, I guess I would also try to. Um, I guess in a way, kind of uh, create not cohorts, but maybe you know these kind of core groups, and so that there is also that kind of facilitation of learning, you know, with your own with your own peers. Now doesn't mean you can't come up and ask more questions, but we have treats back there. They're just they're just crying for you to go back there. I can hear them now. You know, come drink me and eat me. Go take care of them. But the 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 dialogue can continue if you want to. But I appreciate you all coming out. I appreciate and acknowledge uh, Tribal Council coming out. That's a, that's a great honor because Tribal Council is the governing body of a nation, and they're busy. And for them to come down here, for our tribal council to be here is a good sign. So appreciate that. Appreciate you students and your families. And one last thing, there's an evaluation here. You can look through it, provide feedback. 
and get that to our chair, uh, Ed, and just by putting it in this envelope, it'll be there. All right? Yes, one last thing. I just wanted to note that um, those documents are also online. Oh, yeah. The department secretary, and she can email that to you if it's hard for you to sit down and gather your thoughts and yeah, you know, right. adequately, yeah. if it's easier for you to do an evaluation and pass the word on, that those evaluations are available to the chemistry department secretary. Great. So I'm going to quote, yeah. And is, there, is there a specific time frame for, for this candidate in terms of the online? If you're going to leave here and go online, is there a time frame to get that submitted? Uh, no, there is not. Yeah. Uh, because it's going to be a, we're not in a hurry for this, to award this position. We've been given that uh, from the provost to take as much time as it's going to be. I'm in a hurry. Yeah. <laughs> Someone in a hurry, but we can stretch that. <laughs> I can answer that more specifically. Yeah, Ed can answer that. Help you. Decision on the end of March. So that's pretty fast. So slow and fast, I guess. <laughs> we have, yeah, we have. Well, the candidates don't want to make a decision because the candidates are waiting to hear what other jobs and so on. Yeah. So, End of March. That's pretty quick. There's treats back there. Thank you all. I want you to come.